Goodner Girls, uh, a history of children in Queensland mental institutions, is a really important part of our history. You know, we all knew that of the orphanages down the end of the street. There were families, hundreds of families in Australia who hosted children from orphanages on weekends and during school holidays. And I know because my family were one of those. This is the history of survival, but it is all of our history of acknowledgement, of inclusion of all the children who were in institutions and of a punitive welfare system that all of us need to understand and do what we can to not allow this to happen again. This is not just the history of a handful of survivors. This is a central part of Australian history. Yama, and welcome to the National Library of Australia. Uh, my name's Marcus Hughes, and I'm the Director of Indigenous Engagement here at the Library. This morning, we have the, the opportunity to speak and spend some time um, with a remarkable writer, Adele Chenoweth. From the outset, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet today on the land of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri, and I pay with my own respects to the elders past and present and through them to all Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Adele, you've written an amazing book that brings together an incredible amount of story around a group of women that you've referred to as the Goodner Girls. When I first um, was offered the opportunity to to read your book, I was immediately, immediately hit by the resonances that there are for me. As a young fellow growing up in the queer community of Brisbane in the 70s, when my girlfriends had all been to Walston or Wilson or Lawson House, um, to hear that or to see that and read and hear their voices on the page. Um, has been a remarkable experience. And from the outset, I'd love to thank you for that. It's been an absolute privilege. And then we had the opportunity to meet. And it was another delightful experience to, to meet someone that had created this document that has such gravitas, um, but to get to know more about you and your crazy journey um, across the multidisciplinary creative sector into the advocacy sector. Can you tell us a bit more about you? Um, so, you know, that's a hard question for a working class girl from the suburbs, because immediately you hear the inner voice that says, don't get too big for your boots. So it's, it's a privilege <laughs> to be here with you. I, I want to say that too, thank you. Um, so, you know, I grow up in a uh, working class Adelaide. Um, uh, my surname is Cornish, you know, a very significant Cornish mining community in South Australia. On my mother's side, it's the German, um, the, the, you know, the Silesian people that came out in the 19th century. Um, uh, you know, I went to school. <laughs> um, I, uh, and then I became a teacher because that's the classic social mobility degree for um, working class girls, that or nursing. Um, and uh, but then I got really passionate about teaching drama and realised that I needed to do that more. So I um, didn't tell my mum, but I went and auditioned for a theatre director's course. They take one person a year. I got in. I couldn't believe it. So I then studied drama and studied to be a theatre director I, as a you know, mature age student after being a teacher for a while. Um, from that, I got employed on a museum, very significant mm -hmm. museum project. Um, and, and, but I worked a lot with community in that project. Mm -hmm. And so from that, I went to the museum sector. 
Um, I've also worked in the public service um, in policy. Um, I've worked for a student union um, as an organiser. So you're helping students with their campaigns. So, but I suppose, you know, I'm, I'm an artist. I find that a bit of an elitist term, but that's how people have described me. So perhaps I've got to own it. But I'm a teacher, I'm a researcher and, and an advocate. But it's, I don't know, I'm someone with a bee in the bonnet with a few skills. <laughs> and I know exactly what you mean about not being able to tell the family because they wouldn't understand what the business was about or it wasn't respectable or it wasn't secure. Um, and going to theatre um, is such an amazing tool for understanding community and understanding the world in the, which we live. And I think that's um, been one of those remarkable things, again, that I think has joined us together, is that understanding of the power of being able to put a concept into a public platform and really give voice around those issue-based um, notions of society. And it's about the narrative, you know, it's, it's about telling the story in a three-dimensional space. Yeah. And actually that's what museums do, so it's, it's quite a logical step. So with that kind of background, and certainly the focus on notions of narrative, how did you find the Goodner Girls? Yeah. So um, I worked at the National Museum of Australia on an exhibition called Inside Life in Children's Homes and Institutions. It was the realisation of Recommendation 35 of the Senate Report, Forgotten Australians. So um, as, as you know, there were three uh, government, federal government inquiries into it, children who had experienced institutionalised care in Australia. There was the Bringing Them Home report, um, the Stolen Generations, about 50,000 children. There was the uh, Lost Innocence report in 2001 mm -hmm. about uh, former child migrants, about 7,000 children. And then in 2004 there was the Senate report, Forgotten Australians, which focused on non-Indigenous, domestic Australian children who had been institutionalised. The, uh, the Senate inquiry revealed a lack of understanding or recognition of that cohort. So one of the recommendations was that there be an exhibition at the National Museum of Australia. Mm. And that was in 2004, but the Rudd government didn't finance it until, it wasn't financed until the Rudd government came in in 2009. So I was brought on as a curator of that project and that exhibition acknowledged and represented the experiences of childhood institutionalisation of the stolen generations, former child migrants and forgotten Australians. To do that I needed to engage with community and I did, um, and I did I managed a blog, um, and so people, survivors of, of institutionalised child abuse, emailed their stories, mm -hmm. and I came across this particular group of women who had in, been in Walston Park Hospital, an adult psychiatric facility, when they were children. Um, I already knew about this narrative from my previous work as a student as a research organiser at the University of Queensland Union. The report came out when I was working there and I had to be familiar with all the Senate reports. That was part of my job. Um, and I was aware, and then I did more research into that background and looked at some of the submissions and I was aware of this trajectory yeah. of children going from uh, orphanages, some, some of them, and then going into psychiatric facility so I was already aware of that so when I met these women I said yes I understand I understand this history so there was kind of a sense of relief so I met these women through doing that exhibition mm -hmm. so who are the Goodner girls so the Goodner girls uh, that was really um, you know a, a phrase I coined because uh, Walston Park Hospital mm -hmm. or the the Park Centre for Mental Health, as it is now called, outside Ipswich, Queensland, um, is really known to the Queensland 
population as Goodna. They call it Goodna because yeah. it was called it was Goodna Asylum before it was Walston Park Hospital. So they always talked about being in Goodna, even though it was Walston Park Hospital at the time. So there was a policy in Queensland. Uh, uh, started in about the late 1950s, early 1960s from the reports that I read at the time of using a medical model to so-called juvenile delinquents. Now they're so-called because these women had not committed a crime but they were what is known as status offenders. Um, so uh, status offenders means like absconding, smoking, um, hanging out with boys, not crimes, but behaviour that a society at the time doesn't think is appropriate for teenage girls. But most of the, the, uh, the women that I worked with, they had run away from uh, abusive orphanages. So they were running away from criminal uh, assault by adults on them or by, you know, terribly exploitative conditions like the Magdalene Laundry uh, in Brisbane at the time run by the Good Shepherd Sisters. Um, and for that, then they were then put in um, psychiatric. Um, so then there was another layer, which were these detention institutions. There was um, Kalimna run by the Salvation Army, which, you know, used, psych used drugs. Um, there was um, Kerala House out of Ipswich uh, mental facility for teenage girls and then so there were um, specific centres that used a psychiatric model for teenage girls and then some were then taken to an adult psychiatric facility so the Goodner girls are survivors of being child inmates in an adult psychiatric facility in Queensland they did not have a mental illness. They did not commit a crime. Oh, one of the women stole a bike when she was seven, stole a bike to help her run away. Um, and that's who they are. So Adele, with, with Goodner Girls, you're documenting a huge amount of history and the girls are telling you their histories. Is there, and I know it's a really difficult question, but is there just one example of, um, A story that, that, that really summarises the guts of, mm. of some of these women. Well, very hard to choose one story. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I did write the book so it would be a, a, a good read, you mm. know. So there's lots of stories that the reader can, can get from this. But, but there's one narrative, I think, that really points out the resonance today of this. Mm. Because one of the things that we can say is, oh, wasn't that awful? You know, and, and are they all right now? Mm. The thing is, this history lingers. So there's one example of one of the women well into their adulthood, you know, with a job, um, but, but a job that didn't pay enough. So this is at the university sector. She worked, you know, cleaning tables at a university. And you know what universities are like. You don't, you only, if you're casual, you only basically work you know, 26 weeks of the year, you know, you don't work when the students are on leave. So, so she, there she was working on university, in a university cafeteria. This is years after she would got out of Walston Park Hospital, working in a university cafeteria, renting, um, you know, a humble place, single mother, didn't, couldn't, all the, the income she got barely covered the rent. So she collected the doll as, as well and didn't declare it, got done for welfare fraud, got to court, and then the judge said, oh, has she got you know, a criminal record? And they looked at her time in institutions and said, yes, she has. Not understanding that she has never, ever, ever been charged with a crime but that an institutional record was seen as jail time. So this is, this is, you know, this is why this history is so important. So she gets to Bogo Road Jail, as you do. Mm -hmm. And of course, all, the whole thing about prisons is that you, you go to max, right? You go to maximum, you know, mm -hmm. Bogo Road Jail is now yuppie apartments now. But um, uh, 
uh, but you know, when when you go to women, when they were taken to the women's section of Bogo Road Jail, they all went through maximum security, and of course the guards were thrilled that there she was, um, not having uh, because she a welfare fraud was a non-violent offence, mm. that you know she could work in the kitchen, and she said to them, "Well, I'm glad someone's happy." Anyway, so she worked in the kitchen, and because she was in there for a non-violent crime for welfare fraud, um, you know, her job was to help deliver the milk to all the other sections of the jail. And she said, you know, and but of course all the other prisoners, they want, you know, I'm forever passing notes from one prisoner to one section to another. She said, I had a, she had a, had a slit in my shoe where I used to hide the notes, you know. And then one day she was delivering the milk and this particularly vicious prisoner confronted her. And uh, so there she was with the milk trolley. It's a, it was about to be, you know, on for young and old. She said, look, and I did punch her because I know what it looks like when someone's got it in for you. I know that face from Walston Park Hospital. I got one, I got my first punch in because I knew it was the only punch I was going to get. And she broke my nose. All the milk went everywhere. And then the guards came out and said, what's going on here? What's going on here? And she said, I looked at her and she looked at me because I knew right in that moment I had the power to put away in solitary. But I've been in solitary and I know what that's like. So I turned to the guards and I said, oh, I fell over. And she left me alone after that. But I mean, you know, what resilience. But the point is, this is an ongoing narrative mm. that has informed them throughout their adult lives. Mm. It's time to, you know, let it go, acknowledge them and understand. So Adele, what was, what was your driver in connecting with what is quite a deeply emotional, tragic um, narrative? What, what was it that you wanted to give to that? So they were the driver not me. So one, one thing that comes out of this living history is we to always, you know, be reminded of the aid, you know, through the tragedy is an incredible lot of guts, courage mm. and absolute agency mm. by these women who know exactly what they want, who are completely articulate, mm. intelligent, witty, and um, they were the driver. So it was the opening of the exhibition and they said, oh, OK, that's it. Or is that it now? You know, we've done the exhibition. We've made the, the politicians look good. Um, you finished with us now. Mm. Is that it? Are you going to help us get justice? So the driver was this realisation that exhibitions are openings, not endings. Mm. You, um, they are not closures. They are the beginning of something new. And I realised that the story wasn't over. And, and if we can put this, this in a wider context, um, it's, a, it's a great question. I just want to get the answer right. And, and not to talk about me, because it's actually not about me. It's not about me. It's about looking at the systemic structures. And so, you know, I think it is absolutely appropriate for the cultural sector to give something back when people from marginalised communities re-traumatise themselves to give their narrative for an exhibition. A narrative, you know, an exhibition that gets reported in annual reports, that, that makes uh, a cultural organisation look good. They can use it to, to support their assertions that they're inclusive. To take those stories is a bit like going into someone's land and mining the minerals and not giving anything back. Mm. So this sense that we gave you our stories, now what do we get in return? Mm. I think that, that, so they were the driver. Mm. And, and in the, the, I'm just going to call it a document, um, it in is. the documentation, <laughs> it is. It is. Um, you've also included the voices of um, not just the Goodner girls, but people who were associated with. Mm. Um, did you want to talk to that a little bit? So what? So the book 
thank you, Marcus. So the book comprises um, the the oral histories of um, of of four women who were in Goodna, and also three staff members who, at the time, witnessed what was going on, tried to speak out. Um, that that's kind of, in some ways, that's a controversial decision because one of the things you don't want to do is validate, feel that you've got to validate the narrative by the testimony of some professionals. So, you know, you don't want to set, you know, I don't want to set up a situation where well, what they're saying is true because um, these elite professionals also say it was true. But, but if we want to understand, well, instead what I was trying to do is that if we want to understand how systemic abuse occurs, in these institutions, it's important to, to raise awareness about um, how staff somehow don't feel that they have any power, that somehow the system or the, the wider discourse that informs those institutions means that some staff members feel powerless too. So it was important to get that kind of, that picture. Um, and also what the women, they know their story so well, it was, I wanted to place them in a wider socio-political context so that the reader could understand why and how this happens so that we don't repeat it. But I, I want to say that this document, this book, the aim of it wasn't a book. This was a means to a campaign. Let's be clear about that. When they said, are you going to help us get justice? This was about being summoned to campaign shoulder to shoulder with them. This was, this was a call to activism. Nothing less, but I but but it but it needed to be um, a, a campaign that was scaffolded by rigorous research, so that the bureaucrats couldn't fob them off yet again. So it's 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 saying, well, what what research, what skills can I bring the, to the table to support their articulate um, bid for justice? Mm -hmm. So the girls have seen the publication now. Yes. What's their response? Well, being? they saw it before, so in the whole. so um, they so pa so part of my process was to be you know um, ethically rigorous. So um, I worked with them, I interviewed them, um, and then I put their stories together from you know hours and hours of recordings um, and. This wasn't an ethical requirement, but I did it. Um, the usual process is that they see a transcript, but um, because of the real importance of, of agency and not doing anything without um, a collegial methodology, um, uh, they all read and you know approved their chapters. Uh, so they they'd seen it long before it was published, but what they hadn't seen was the introduction and that they really liked that. that, that meant a lot to them, that it was clearly explained why they were there and why it was wrong that they were there. One woman, when she received the book, um, she told me that she cried because she felt a sense of relief that I don't have to hold on to the story anymore. She's told that story over and over and over again, often on deaf ears. And the fact she can now let it go and just say, here's the book, you read it. Mm. So Adele, when we talk about the capturing of these, these stories, um, how, how important were the, the recordings of those, mm. those oral histories in the process? Yeah. So um, oral history is a very important part um, of public history mm. and you know it's something that um, the National Library of Australia had done so you know we had had the um, the Rudd government finance the museum exhibition mm. the Rudd government also um, supported funded the National Library of Australia to record oral histories of former child migrants mm. and the forgotten Australians. So you here at the National Library have this really fantastic mm. collection of oral histories of former child migrants and the forgotten Australians. Um, so it's really, it was applying that 
methodology um, to this, to my work with these women, mm. um, and 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 in a little different. So, what the National Library so brilliantly does is it records oral histories that then you can access and listen to. Um, this process was not about recording their oral histories as uh, an outcome in itself, but as a means to, a, as part of a wider methodology, which was about archival collection. So I looked for archival records. I sourced the government reports of the day um, in which these policies were made. Um, I, I also, you know, with their blessing, um, they offered me their own childhood records, their own archival collection. I, I want to say the other thing about these women is that they were incredible archivists. Mm. They archived their own campaign. Yeah. So it was an oral history methodology. It was an archival methodology. And it was also about um, understanding the, the, doing the research on the theoretical lenses so I could hang this narrative on. So a lot of secondary source research into the history of institutionalised care over time and internationally. So the oral histories um, comprised one part of this research, but probably central to the research. Um, I was really aware that they had told their stories all over and over and over again, that that was re-traumatising, so it was important to get that on record so that they didn't have to bear that burden over and over again. Um, and, and really for it to be testimony as evidence. Um, I had gone to the Royal Commission um, of into institutionalised responses to child sexual abuse with them. So we'd already, you know, it, that, that notion of oral history as evidence, as testimony in, in a legal inquiry, you know, was, was very close to my mind and understanding. So the book then comprises my research of their oral histories um, and the archival research I did in an introduction. But what was really important in writing the book there were, you know, I was approached by one publisher, it's so hard to turn down a publisher, I cannot tell you, who wanted it completely rewritten so that it was more of a textbook and that I'd refer to these um, oral histories you know, and quoted by them. And no, they had to be self-contained chapters without sort of territorialising them mm. with academic speak. It was, um, so it was really, once I had written them, it was about finding a publisher that understood the value of an oral history as a self-contained chapter, mm. not to be referred to and quoted amidst academic mm. clutter. And that authorship, that acknowledgement of authorship is so critically important mm. in the whole picture of what you're creating. Yeah, it's about who has the voice. Yeah. So, I know working with community when you're entrusted with their knowledges or their experiences and you, you do observe that absolute sense of due diligence around the care for that material. I know how exhausting um, that can be and how you take on the weight of that responsibility. How did you manage that for yourself? So, I mean, I saw um, a trauma counsellor. And uh, so what we're talking about, I think, here is the notion of the vicarious trauma. Mm. And what I understand that to be as a lay person is that it's a, a para it's comes from within the paradigm of, of cognitive psychology. So you know you're going to get a whole lot of psychologists writing in saying I've got it wrong. So I'm a lay person, but I understand that it's the uh, it comes from within the paradigm of co cognitive psychology. And basically, mm. vicarious trauma says that when you are experiencing a tra when you're hearing a traumatic narrative. The brain doesn't understand the difference between you hearing it and actually experiencing it. So it's why we, 
you know, get the adrenaline rush in scary movies. Mm -hmm. You know, we're on that spacecraft with the alien. You know, that's what the brain thinks. Yeah. Or, or why, you know, the roller coaster industry, you know, is mm -hmm. big because people, you know, the, the body really does think it's falling. Okay, so, um, so therefore you go to a trauma counsellor and, um, and you just get a really good one because mm -hmm. a good trauma counsellor totally understands why you're doing what you're doing. They don't try to talk you out of it. They just give you a whole lot of techniques to manage it. The aim is to go before you even get any symptoms so you, you're managing it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and sometimes I'd, I'd go and I'd be really upset about something and he'd laugh and he says don't you realize how funny that is and then you know so it's always about a contextualization so I would do that mm -hmm. um, you know for, yeah but but I suppose to answer the question uh, the trauma for one of a better noun of not doing anything would have been far worse than doing it so the other way is through action through getting it done, getting this narrative out in the public and trying to move bureaucrats to finally take notice of this. Because what they wanted was financial redress. There had been the Ford inquiry in 1998, but adult institute, children who were in adult institutions, the Ford inquiry was the, the Queensland Commission into abuse of children in institutionalised care. But the Ford inquiry excluded children in adult institutions, so they never had redress. So when they mm. said, we want justice, that's what they meant. So how did I just, uh, you just, you uh, keep your foot on the brake pedal and you get a resolution to it. The mm. outcome is, is the driver for health. So where to next? So I think there are several things. Um, there needs to be more research done mm -hmm. and I think there needs to be a rigorous conversation, several conversations about how the cultural sector in Australia can work with marginalised groups for social change. Mm -hmm. It sounds difficult but what the process of Goodner Girls has told me is how achievable it is. So, one thing that we need to look at is um, we do know um, that children in orphanages in the 20th century were used the subject of medical tests. There needs to be research in what those tests were and those survivors want to know what they were injected with, mm. right? We do know the Goodner girls, if you read the book, they'll talk about the uh, ridiculous dosages of psychiatric drugs mm. that, that, uh, that they were enforced to take. These women did not have a mental illness and yet they were given psychiatric drugs. All that, need, that needs to be an investigation into the medication mm. and institutionalisation. Uh, Two of the women have had children with um, really severe uh, brain tumours and they are concerned at the intergeneral, intergenerational effects of that medication. That, that needs to be researched and the Queensland Government need to come clean on whatever the findings are. There's also a lot of anecdotal evidence about um, children that may have died at Walston Park. Now it's anecdotal. But, you know, I think there needs to be some research on the admission records, the burial records, and when they don't align, where, you know, at the body. There needs to be, we need to, co uh, there needs to be more research on childhood admissions into Walston Park Hospital. Those archival records are um, kept uh, very close to that organisation's chest, and I would say that's not democratic. Um, research is a democratic process and that, that needs to be, that work needs to be done. I also think that in child protection services that there needs to be an acknowledgement of the importance of historical research in understanding current policy. So I've seen several documents about current child protection policies, there's no reference to any history. We need to see this through line. And I think that our cultural sector needs to engage courageously, ethically, 
with marginalised communities um, suffering from trauma. And I think there needs to be more recognition of all the children that were in care, as well as the important recognition of the stolen generations, um, the forgotten Australians and former child migrants that there needs to be. The National Library has done it. Um, you've, you've done it here with your oral histories, uh, but there needs to be, I think the museum sector needs to have more ongoing representation of that. So that's a start. And it's a big shopping list. It's a beautiful shopping list. <laughs> and once we've bought all of those things, what do you think it'll look like for our young ones? For I our think next that, um, that, that yeah, and this is where, but before I answer that question, mm. I want to say that when one is doing this work, um, the best way you can do this work is to know your skills and qualifications mm. and don't step over that. Mm. So, you know, so I'm not a social worker, I'm not a counsellor. And so now I'm a little bit treading my toe in the water mm. outside my work as, you know, theatre director, curator, researcher. But I would want to imagine or hypothesise what a child protection service and policy might look like mm. when those children in out of home care have um, more agency and say in placements mm. and this as I say this is my hypothesis and what might happen if those that policy was formulated from regular and rigorous dialogue with those who have been through it the forgotten Australians mm. former child migrants and the stolen generations it's a it's a nation and a culture that knows how to join the dots it's beautiful Adele, thank you for sharing your process, the experience that you've gone through in creating this incredibly important document. Do you have any last words? Just to say thank you so very much and, and I'm so grateful to the National Library of Australia to allow this, you know, what may be deemed a difficult but a very important conversation, mm. you know. It's, um, thank you so much for um, acknowledging the Goodner girls and m putting them right at the centre here mm. today of the National Library of Australia mm. so they can hold their heads up high and know that they are an important part of our public history. Thank you for sharing um, the stories of the Goodner Girls with us today and the stories around how it happened, what your process was, what it meant to you, what the importance of these stories are. And I think one of the things that you've really reinforced is the importance of being able to capture our personal stories in ways that are other than a word on a page. That for me as a First Nations man, our stories, our knowledges, our understandings and beliefs have all been passed on through that oral history process. And to understand that those processes are so significant and powerful today um, fills me with great pride around what you do, around what my cultures do, and what we do here at the National Library to capture that and support that process and provide a window for the general Australian population to provide through that window access to a deeper understanding of our social condition and hopefully build a much more socially cohesive society. Thank you. Thanks Marcus and here, here. Thank you.